Uh, good morning, all your colleagues, uh, my friends. Uh, the first uh, thing I uh, did was to look at the, this picture of uh, space, which I really like because it's a totally different uh, space from the space I will be talking about. I would like to talk about the general framework of Central Europe, which uh, we created in the last few decades. I would mainly, I would like to talk mainly about uh, cultural and historical frameworks that have a little bit of a different design than this space you can see here. There is not one, one center, one uh, core, and I would like to begin my lecture with this. Uh, the concept of Central Europe always uh, was based on uh, some kind of idea of a center, like in geographical center uh, in Europe. In the last thousand years, there were a lot of uh, centers, and we were looking at Central Europe as a sort of center that uh, was um, a main point. That's the main characteristic of uh, Central Europe, the term Central Europe. Uh, the second characteristic is uh, the question what the Central Europe actually is. Is it like a topographical uh, concept or uh, is it the term? We don't know. Is it some kind of a weather forecast? I don't want to talk about this, but there is a there was a big discussion in the 80s, which uh, uh, was uh, centered about the uh, term Central Europe and the question what is Central Europe and uh, whether there actually is a Central Europe. I don't want to question the existence of Central Europe. The third main question which came up uh, when uh, people try to characterize the Central Europe is the question what is Central Europe and what is the difference between uh, Central Europe as a fact, as a utopia or as a myth. Uh, in my lecture I would like to partly uh, talk about this question but I would like to focus on different points and different answers to different questions concerning the different uh, forms of operations in Central Europe that uh, took place in the last 100 years. So um, I said something a little bit about the planet you can see right behind me, uh, but now let's start. Uh, what I would like to tell you, it's not um, really theoretical, it's mainly about general ideas of the myth, what, what the myth of Central Europe is. There is not only one myth, but there are several myths. Uh, as I already said, it became a bit of a fashion of the last two decades to question the existence of Central Europe. In the Czech and Slovak uh, culture, we really uh, did not look at the problem of Central Europe in the last decades. But uh, there is also uh, one publication that uh, was dedicated to the debate about Central Europe in the last decades, uh, which was written by Mr. Havlicek. 
and he discussed the question of Central Europe. But if you have a look on the historical map of Czech and Hungarian state between the 13th and 15th century, and also at the territorial development of the Habsburg monarchy in the years 1526 uh, up to 1918, uh, you realize that uh, the area of today's uh, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovenia, Hungary, Austria, Slovenia, Croatia, a part of Italy and also Romania and at some points also Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia creates a common historical area. Uh, this uh, area was dominated also by the dynasties of Przemyslet, Luxembourg, Arpads, Anjou, Piast, Jigelons, Habsburgs, and uh, they were th there were disputes about domination of this area. Uh, the, this uh, area was uh, getting bitter and uh, a big bigger and also smaller. It was pulsating, and this uh, area was uh, then uh, dominated by uh, certain dynasties. For this uh, area, uh, the name or the term uh, Central Europe or Central Eastern Europe was used. Uh, there is not a, a unique terminology that is used for this uh, area, and I will uh, come to this point uh, later again. As I already said, uh, this uh, area is historic historically pulsating, it's getting bigger and smaller, and I uh, know only one example uh, of a dynasty or uh, some kind of uh, state that dominated this uh, area and that, that made this uh, area smaller and it was the Czechoslovakia when it split into Czech and Slovakia in 1989. That, that was the only time when, uh, in, the, in the complicated uh, history of uh, Central Europe, when uh, some state uh, made a reduction of this area. This process is based on three moments. The first one is the creation of uh, state centers, uh, which is mm, actually the same as uh, the creation of uh, national states. The concept of uh, Central Europe comes into uh, mind in the 18th or early 19th century and it becomes more and more important and the relations of Central Europe and uh, the most important relation is between the West and East, not between South and uh, North. It's a fact that this, uh, the term Central Europe is uh, some kind of a center between West and East, uh, which came into existence in 18th century, because uh, before this time there was uh, mainly uh, the problem of uh, central between North and South. Um, this uh, term is also used up to today. The second moment is uh, the pulsating uh, of uh, this area by the domination, and it's, these are the um, tries of the, uh, different dynasties to overrule these areas. Uh, there was a kind of a hegemony in the central Europe dominated by uh, the dynasties of Premislet, Luxembourg or Egalonian. And uh, Habsburgs then uh, uh, ruled over this area for uh, approximately four of hundred years. There's oh, one thing which is quite strange and that's connected to Austri Austrian 
culture, it's kind of tendency to apologize for the Habsburg uh, monarchy in the sense um, that is connected with post-colonial uh, theories. I would come to that point uh, later in my lecture again. There is an attempt to um, to uh, employ the post-colonial theories uh, when concerning the Central Europe. The third moment is uh, the overlap or uh, the intersection of uh, uh, individual Central European dynasties in the uh, pan-European area uh, that uh, took place under the Holy Roman Empire and also uh, Austrian Empire, uh, Germany, France, uh, Spain, Italy, Russia, and Ottoman Empire. Uh, in uh, 1989, there was a change. And then, uh, since then, we are witnesses of uh, uh, different political views. Uh, which has its roots in maybe 16th, but for certain in 19th century. Um, the concept of uh, Central Europe on uh, its own is a kind of a hybrid term connected with hybrid myths. Uh, there is, uh, from the historic point of view, not one Central Europe. Uh, there was a book written by Jeno Sisa, uh, Free Historical Regions of Europe, and uh, there is a cont contemplation about the uh, hybrid um, forms of Central Europe. In early Middle Ages, there was a change uh, and this uh, this uh, has an Im had an impact on the culture, economical structure of Central Europe. Um, he uh, was looking for uh, key points that uh, appeared again and again in the history of uh, Central Europe also in 18th and 19th century, and the myths of Central Europe uh, came from the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a myth of uh, Central Europe uh, planted by Germany, and there was a uh, uh, there was a uh, Austria-Hungary uh, and the idea of uh, Germany, uh, Hungary, Austria and uh, Hungarian Austrian Empire. This idea was drowned in the cataclysm of the First World War and what was left was just uh, remains of Central European myth and uh, Central Europe became a uh, um, test rabbit of uh, the third center according to Karl Kraus uh, or according to the uh, fate of good soldier Schweig by Jaroslav Hasek. Uh, the, there are historical and semiotic uh, uh, well what is what is uh, what his historical proofs uh, about which relate to central Europeans uh, hymns which oscillate around uh, um, a mythic center what became a myth also, what appeared to be a myth, was the uh, interwar rationalist uh, idea of the Vienna School, uh, which was uh, established uh, all based on the optimism of Karl Popper. Um, um, 
We don't know whether it lies in uh, uh, Carpathian, Ukraine, uh, Karlsbad, or wherever, but it's just a um, meant uh, center of Europe. On the other hand, what was a rationalist uh, the rationalist idea of the Vienna School uh, ba is based on uh, the uh, false uh, ideas uh, of uh, the Second World War, because basically the Second World War uh, changed the terminology and it uh, led to a strict division of Europe to West Europe and East Europe. And, of course, Central Europe uh, had no um, more reason to exist. After 25, 26, 27 years, until 1989, uh, when the East and West Europe uh, was replaced by uh, West Euro European community and Central Europe uh, considered uh, itself to be uh, the core of the uh, culture. And also in the discussion of Western Europe, again, uh, there appears uh, the division between East and West Europe. And many times it happens that uh, what uh, we consider Central Europe, the Western Europe considers uh, to be Eastern Europe. The question is what it means, but uh, it's just a question for discussion. It's not something that I uh, perceive as positive, because it means the return to the historical type that worked after the Second World War for 40 years. Uh, the myth of Central Europe as utopia was ba founded by uh, Istvan uh, Yusuf uh, Bibo uh, because he uh, described the character of Western Europe. And in the 80s, uh, this was uh, more de further developed by other uh, authors. Uh, the illusions uh, confirmed its hybrid character. Uh, uh, it seemed that the uh, introduction of new Central European uh, and Eastern European countries into European structures uh, could appear, uh, could confirm the West European character of Central Europe. Um, but the re repetition of uh, hybrid uh, Central European myth could avoid uh, the, this situation resulting in um, the self-colonization uh, according to Soviet, but not the Western uh, model. So this idea seemed to be very strong, uh, and at the beginning of this century, some cultural theorists uh, asked uh, question according to the model of Kiosef uh, and they use the orientalistic idea of post-colonialism to Central Europe and the question they ask was whether the Western orientation does not mean the Central European self-colonization according to the Western model. So instead of uh, Soviet influence on the Central European uh, colonization, according to this theory, the self-colonization, this Eastern self-colonization compared to the Western self-colonization should not be present in Central Europe. Uh, and it should not be, a, it's, it's like a planet uh, circulating around uh, cultural um, history. 
the Central European uh, area uh, consists of many uh, warning signals of new hybrid, hybrid uh, nature. Uh, there is uh, new uh, autocratism, and this also uh, relates to new social relationship. It uh, does not have a nature of something uh, inhomogeneous. Uh, it's very varied. It can be multi-layered, multi. Uh, it, ha it can have various meanings. But the hi word hybrid, it can also come from hybris. Uh, which works uh, as uh, mm, being too proud. Uh, this is something we can uh, relate to the today's situation. All these are uh, elements of current hybridity, uh, which uh, presented itself in Central Europe, uh, regardless of uh, whether the individual countries became part of European structures or not. It's not a phenomenon uh, which would have a realistic, uh, big realistic meaning, but it has a myth, uh, mythological meaning, even though this myth is uh, illusional. A common uh, bond in uh, uh, Central Europe uh, was formed uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century. It was formed by Jews. They were an element uh, which uh, was different, which presented everything which was different. And we can call it uh, Central European momentum, everything that was common uh, throughout all other nations in Europe. This was something which was, which unified culture uh, of individual countries. Jews uh, basically disappeared from the map of Central Europe uh, after the Holocaust. Um, uh, it was a stigma and trauma uh, which was not overcome until today in Central Europe. Uh, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, uh, they are, the Jews were nearly uh, um, liquidated in a in these countries, and the minority, there are only small minorities uh, on, in these countries today. The minorities uh, are naturally assimilated. The number of Hungarians living in Slovakia uh, was uh, decreased from 580,000 to some 200,000. The only minority which is increasing in Central Europe are the Roma uh, people. The only question that was left uh, and the uh, phenomenon of ethnic uh, variety, variety is the real paradox. On one hand, we have the fathom pain of fear, of everything strange, everything different, but uh, there is less and less different things here in Central Europe, which I mean, uh, by different, I mean Jews, for example, etc. Uh, on the other hand, we still have the fathom, phantom pain, which is a historic fiction, which basically has a myth of nature, mythological nature, and on the other hand, there is a problem which is still not a real problem, but the fear of it becoming a real problem in Central European space uh, creates unbelievable um, barrier against uh, the Central European uh, area behaving on 
on a rational uh, level, which by which I mean immigrants. It's a paradox, but I believe this is based on the homogenization of Central European space and uh, the, the area of national countries or national states. Uh, this leads to the idea that the these um, closed countries um, cannot open to uh, to, hum to to these uh, new or strange elements, which creates fear. The question of immigrants then is not uh, is only a transformed. Uh, uh, fear of from Jews, uh, Roma people, and other ethnic uh, uh, people. If I uh, augment this, uh, if I take this into extreme, the immigrants could uh, become Jews and uh, gypsy people of central people. Jews are the phantom pain of Central Europe, and uh, the gypsy people are the real problem, and the immigrants threaten to become a problem. I would like to become, oh, sorry, to come back to Central European myths. Uh, in the 20th century, we have two phases. The first phase uh, consists, or oh, we discussed, in the first phase, we discussed uh, the, actually, the notion of Central Europe, Middle Europa, Ost Middle Europa, Zwischen Europa, Central Europa. It was a German problem. Uh, it was not historically uh, established, and Germany uh, did not become the central power between West and uh, Europe and uh, Russia. And after the Second World War, uh, the, um, Fra France, and that was also the case of France. Uh, uh, it only became it. Uh, all that was left was the myth of uh, the Sacher uh, cake, Ringstrasse, the Vienna fiacre, Vienna carriage, horse carriage, and uh, milled wine. Um, the second phase, uh, in the second phase, there was discussion about Central Europe in the 80s of uh, the last century, and it had two. Uh, interconnected aspects. The first uh, uh, was uh, Milan Kundera, who mentioned the uh, value area, and Georgi Konrad, who talked about uh, the s mm, spiritual uh, dimension of Central Europe. Next aspect was geopolitical, and it uh, was based on whether uh, the Soviet Union uh, could um, be taken away from Central Europe. Uh, we can also talk about cultural myth of Central Europe. It's not a uh, world opinion. Uh, I am very well aware that the intellectual discussion was influenced by the opinions by the 90s and it wasn't a good situation. And uh, Central European was Central Europe was replaced by the myth and utopia. In the first part of the 90s, the discussion ended a discussion about Central Europe as an intellectual place. There was no more of the spiritual place. And the eight, 1989 was the landmark. So a new reality, but not a spiritual one, was established. The Central European discussion after the second part in the second part of the 90s transferred. 
there were different narratives introduced and for literary scholars and uh, as was Gauss or Milikovsky, the transfer wasn't good, but it's up to a discussion. I would like to mention one particular case, and this is a Central European concept in Pavel Velikovsky novel. It is named All I Know About Central Europe, and he says that Central Europe can be considered a natural environment all people are working hard from morning till night. However, some people already know that there are other things besides besides work. And they want to explore that. And for Milikovsky, Milikovsky perceives the Central Europe myth like that. He advocates for simple people to be aware of these of this situation. Merikovsky knows that this concept of Central Europe is important and it leads to more thorough knowledge of self-awareness and according to Milikovsky the myth of Central Europe is becoming a fleeting notion and the emotional concept of Central Europe is according to Milikovsky is designated to some state of mind and this scholar perceived this spiritual notion as, as a melancholy. Central European myth wasn't about the end of the world anymore, and he followed the work of Kundera and Handke. And the Central European myth became an existentialism and some latent notion. I would just like to note that I specifically choose this novel because it mentions the writer on the road and his perception of Central Europe and his perception of folk culture and the writer goes to specifically to city of Olomouc. He travels through Brno as well and he is reminiscing about his father because father of Velikovsky was a well-known scholar of medieval times and the scholar on his way reflects the memory of the first train from Brno to Olomouc which was also described in one anthology edited by Masra and there is a discussion about if the writer really entered Olomouc or not. Milikovsky thought that he created a fiction of himself visiting Olomouc, but in reality, in 1937, he visited Olomouc several pages mentions mention that he describes himself as a adventurer and the connection to central europe is his experience i mentioned this because we are now in alamot 
but also as a connector between facts and fiction. And the notion that the facts are perceived by Arthur as fiction and they become a fact. So there is a really close connection between imagination and experience reality, which is kind of extraordinary. Contemporary situation, that's what I will talk about next. So the hybrid notion of Central Europe. I will represent it by one example. Last year I was on a conference and one thing happened. The audience from Ukraine and Belarus have the, they tend to expand the borders of Central Europe to East and Polish, Czech and Slovak audience speak about Central Europe as an opposition to those countries. However, they didn't know that they are actually getting closer to Eastern European borders, such as the Belarus border and Ukrainian border. So the hybridity of Central Europe is a very flexible notion which still is valid at the present day. I have another thing to mention which is poetry and the homogenic tendencies which are connected to that notion. And basically it seems that Central European countries remain a hybrid entities. To conclude, I would circle back to the Central European myth as a concept what exactly means Central Europe and what exactly can be culturally anchored as this concept. And I tried to convey my notion that there are different concept or concepts of Central Europe. Firstly, the Central Europe can be perceived as, as a concept which is somehow created, then it is expanded and becomes a terminological fact. In a second fact, then there is a diservification of the concept and a deconstruction of the concept of the Central Europe. And there is a question mark, what is next? And I think that after the question mark, there is a circling back to the first phase, to the concept of different Central Europes. So, they are myths about hybridity of Central Europe or Central Europes. However, your universe, which is depicted on this image, is a really nice concept, and I wish that several universes in Central Europe would connect together in a one point and become a powerful notion 
which would create a, some kind of solar system, which would contain several planets or countries, if you want. And this system would be very flexible and we would operate it well. And I hope that you enjoyed my lecture. Thank you for your attention.